over the oceans like slave boats shipping me Hashtag that's the only way that they listen be The vocalist that verifies it vividly I bring the vortex straight to your vicinity What is outside is within The mind regulates the hand that masters the pen The pen is mightier than the sword But the tongue is mightier still The star gate to the mind's revealed Yeah, and yo what's outside is within The mind regulates the hand that masters the pen The pen is mightier than the sword But the tongue is mightier still The star gate to the mind's revealed The vortex look at Alright, um, people, uh, your host Cyclone is here and I have a special guest. Would you like to um, address the people with who you are? My name's Kevin Batchin Singh. I'm currently uh, assistant head teacher in the PRU and a psychodynamic counsellor. And it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the platform. I am blessed to be on this platform. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Much love, much love. So, I have um, put aside some questions here for you. And um, if you don't mind, let's jump into the first one. The first question is, what are some of the common challenges faced by black children growing up in households with absent fathers? Uh, that question is a very deep question. Mm. Um, and really, I couldn't provide an answer that would exhaust all the factors. Mm. Um, to give a, a, a really explicit answer, that would probably take weeks or months or years or whatever. But some of the challenges with absent fathers, I mean, really, I, you know, my, my life was sort of, can be seen as cliched. Single parent family, um, council estate, no dad, didn't even know my dad or whatever. So, you know, uh, and involved in street orientated activities at mm -hmm. certain points in time. Um, but over time, being brought up by my mum, who done an excellent job and as black mothers out there do, um, and they're not given the accolades enough for the work they do, mm -hmm. you know. But um, my mum done a great job there's a complexity to me and my mum's relationship like they are in a lot of families um, in regards to culture because my mum's Trinidadian Asian mm -hmm. um, and obviously I'm a, a, I am identify as a black man so there's other complexities in there but she's done a great job but understanding that my mum couldn't grow me into a man because she wasn't one and I didn't identify with her as a man there were no you know, there's no masculine traits. A woman can act a certain way or behave a certain way, but it's not the same masculine way that's projected into you as a young boy. Mm -hmm. So understanding how to grow into a man and operate as a black man in a society at times that you can feel the oppression, you can feel the racism, you can feel the discrimination and navigating through your social space as a man, you know, if your father isn't about, where do you get that from? Mm. As a young person, I got that from my friends. Uh, and a lot of my friends weren't the best role models. So yeah. I gravitated towards a certain way of being. Um, and I think it's really important. You know, and there was uh, Ian Wright. There's a, a famous interview with Ian Wright where, because his dad wasn't around. Mm -hmm. And he had this, I think, white coach or whatever. This guy that, that played that role for him. But he'd found out he was dead. But Ian Wright was supposed to have been off the rails for a good while. Mm. And suddenly in this interview, that guy was still alive and they brought him back to the stadium and Ian Wright broke down. But it was him that sort of gave him some sort of, I don't know, solidified him as a man or with some form of masculinity, in, 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 induced some masculinity so, uh, and some morals into him mm -hmm. as a man. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, for, for black boys more so nowadays, I feel... Um, with a lack of emphasis on our history and the greatness of our people um, and understanding that we came from kings and queens and we were the first people to develop math, science, astronomy, everything, paper, calendar. Um, even the other day I found out that was a black man that, you know, um, invented the helicopter, mm. which I didn't know. Um, you know, understanding this and this being vocalised by a man to a boy um, and reinforced and sh giving you the, the tools to, to defend yourself um, psychically in the in environment and as well as physically. That's really important and, and, and to have uh, a moral code that 
is about, you know, being ultimately, as black people, we are some of the nicest people on the planet. We've faced so much atrocities and still come out the other end being nice to people. Um, and as a man and as a black man, I think that's what you're supposed to give to your boy. Mm -hmm. You know, so... You know, I could say a lot more about it, but <laughs> no, that's the, that's 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 a nice um, eye opener. I feel that for, for a lot of people listening, you know, and uh, you know, these sort of things are not even really spoken about it amongst certain people. So, what a good way to open it up, you know what I mean? Second question: How how do absent fathers affect the overall dynamics of black families and the development of black children? Oh, where are you getting these questions from? <laughs> <laughs> Absent fathers. So, um, you know, we, we, we exist in a, a new age, so to speak. Back in the day, the, the man generally was seen at, at the head of the household in a certain respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, things have changed um, in a certain way. But black family dynamics... Men still, uh, even though women play the central role, mm. let's say how it is, men pretend to be <laughs> at, the, at the forefront of the family. Yeah. yeah. Nowadays, a lot of men, especially with certain insecurities, have felt that they've lost power with their, their, their missus working mm. um, and there being a certain level of independence. Mm -hmm. But again, without, you know, it's like in, in um, theory and this, Edible complex and this triangle with mum, dad, and the child. Like, you have a child that's balanced l in a, the best way between two parents. Mm. When one of them's missing, and the man for a boy, more so, and for, you know, even a daughter, but more so for a boy, when that, when that man's missing um, and mum's alone, and the boy is getting influenced by friends um, and mum's or the authoritarian way of being isn't working on that boy where maybe as a man because when you project yourself out onto a boy as a man they feel something different mm. you know they identify with the masculine side of a man um, and sometimes boys can see their mum especially when they reach teenage years as a pushover mm. um, even though they can impose themselves on the child in a certain way especially if you've been uh, addressing your child's behavior in a certain way from when he was young quite sternly not like in our day where there was licks um but you're, you've kept that child on the straight and narrow for a good while but after a while when they experience their teenage years and they're with friends mm. um even a man's tone has a certain level of power over that child so mm -hmm. you know uh, um there being no man in the household to sort of hold especially a boy together but they're just being you know it, back in the day in africa they had it was like all low parenting everyone parented the child yeah so when there's one one main element missing mm -hmm. things start falling or you have to be tighter with things so for a, a, a father not to be around for a boy and just for the family in general you know but you have to it is is detrimental but you have to look back I think uh, when it comes to black family dynamics and our colonial past, how that's had such a detrimental impact in our functioning today. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm. <clears throat> in, in what way does the education system fail black children, particularly in terms of providing equal opportunities and support? You know, it's funny because um, I was speaking to someone the other day about underrepresentation in schools. Um, and in England, 95, 93% of the head teachers are white. 90% mm -hmm. um, of the deputies and assistant head teachers are white. 85% uh, of all classroom teachers are white. And according to the Black Equity Organization, that made that got a beautiful report called um, "Brick Wall After Brick Wall." Mm. <laughs> um, black teachers make up 0.9 percent of the teaching workforce, so that underrepresentation alone shows a disparate disparity for young black boys in regards to being able to 
relate generally you know mm. uh, cultural competency is a big thing so if there's a lack of a cultural presence in the school what are you getting if there's a, a sort of distinct um, oppositional sort of uh, character from certain members of staff that are not of the same colour that don't understand your cultural norms mm. and me looking a certain way and talking a certain way making a joke but then as a consequence of you being or embracing your blackness in the same way you would talk as home at home as a young boy but now what you're saying is misconstrued and seemingly rude mm. but really to me or you when they're conversing or communicating with us, it seems normal. Mm. But it's not see, seen in the same light because there's no cultural competency or lack of it in school. So, you know, for me in schools, having an understanding of not only black culture, but all kinds of cultures, you know, and I've been around for a little while in education. Um, and I've seen at different points in time some very strange and unsettling behaviours from teaching staff towards young young students you mm. know hmm <clears throat> um how does exposure to violence drugs and sexualized behavior impact the upbringing of young black people well it's across the board now isn't it i mean some people i mean it's like this well young black people young people in general are different nowadays mm. yeah social media media um parenting styles are different mm. uh the whole social landscapes quite different compared to when we were young uh morality and and uh people's ideas of what are right and what's wrong nowadays are completely different mm -hmm. um social media has given people a platform uh to be able to be what they couldn't be in reality mm -hmm. so I think when it comes to images um, of violence of sex um, uh, advertise uh, the advertisement of drugs it's because they sell all kinds of drugs online across the board children are affected but I think when you come from a place and, and, I, and I you know I was gonna go through some more when I talked about colonialism and, and black family dynamics but when it comes to young black people and them coming from a place especially when you suffered some people don't they didn't think that trauma could be passed on there was a, a stage in time but people know about transgenerational trauma nowadays mm -hmm. um so from colonial living and our us having to adapt in a certain way to survive young people nowadays have also had that trauma passed down but also feel that they have to adapt in their environments to survive in a certain way so if you come from an impoverished if you lived in an impoverished environment mm -hmm. um and your family's already sort of dysfunctional because they've suffered trauma and trauma has passed down so i'll go back to the trauma so if you've got all those factors at work and you've got this lack of self-esteem you you can't You've got a, you have a hard time finding your self identity. Mm -hmm. uh, establishing any knowledge of self at a young age isn't easy. What do you gravitate to now? Gang violence has become rife in in England. Um, more so, people say, is a consequence of it being something fashionable in America and it coming across the water. Mm. Now, if you're failing in school, if you've got low self esteem. A lack of self-identity and you can get that and also you know nowadays in film and media who do they present as a hero the bad man so nowadays if you're the bad guy it's like training day you had you had Denzel Washington that was a bad cop that was a hero you've got mm. people like um, Vin Diesel that play um in pitch black he plays Riddick Riddick yeah, yeah that's this sort of mercenary type guy but he's actually the hero and a lot of the films nowadays what's portrayed is this sort of anti-hero mm. um and you know it's not uncommon for for young people to identify with the bad man that's the hero in film so even that's one s small segment of something being projected and encoded into your head as something good mm. um 
the violence nowadays that you can see on social media is obscene. Um, things that I never see when I was young. So, uh, and the impact on that psychically um, is tremendous. So, and, and you'd get young people demonstrating very strange behaviors nowadays so mm. whether it's whether it's seeing the violence or on social media wanting to express yourself through violence as a consequence of low self-esteem by joining a gang and wanting to stab um you know as a consequence of, of that violence we've got a young a lot of young black boys dying on the streets yeah. um sexualized behavior we've got a, young, a lot of young girls all colours, you know, and I'm talking more on the black level that are doing things they're not supposed to be doing or getting very pregnant early, getting pregnant early or et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the family itself, if you're living in certain areas that are impoverished, to hold it together and be able to, be able to hold your family together in a way where you can elevate out of that situation is very hard. You have to have a very strong parent or two very strong parents to be able to establish that you know mm, that's right what role does music play in shaping the behavior and attitudes of young black individuals especially in relation to violence and drug culture <laughs> yeah you know why i'm laughing i, I love hip-hop music yeah <laughs> yeah right i love hip-hop but i know you love hip-hop music yeah yeah definitely yeah. definitely um and i've been into hip-hop i was now for us old school people are over 50. If you're into hip hop, people know the Johnson Crew, Planet Patrol. Um, they'd know, who else would they know? They'd know um, Soul Sonic Force. They'll know Grandmaster Kaz. You know, these are, they'll know the Fat Boys, Biz Marquee, Big Daddy Kane. And coming through, you know, from, from early 80s when we was, when it was electro, to to hip hop to rap to hip hop 90s um mob deep uh capone and noriega mike geronimo whoever um onyx or whatever uh, to now like it's a beautiful thing the the hip hop scene but the music as uh, as hip hop used to have genres um so you had the native tongues mm. um you had people like x clan that were pro black mm -hmm. you had um Keras one and Scott LaRock and at first when he came out with criminal when they came out with criminal minded they seemed really gangster but became very very educational more than anything else so yeah. you had all these different genres of hip-hop that that really um kept you away from well kept you immersed in pro-blackness mm. and wanting to elevate yourself in life um but you know people want to associate gangster rap with um, NWA um, a lot of the time um, before that there was lots of different kinds of rap there was horror rap with mm -hmm. um, um, ghetto boys um, uh, gangster nip uh, even the grave diggers so there was a lot of different people that had horror rap but this gangster gangster rap but it sort of always was about mm. but it, in different forms even from back in the day but I think what it is, is that there's this resonance, this feeling that music gives you generally. You know, in my day, if you was going to meet a young lady um, and go out and then you might end up back at their house, you might put on the Jodeci CD because mm. that gives you a certain feeling, you right. know. Um, if you're at, uh, back in the day, a carnival, um, when Onyx Slam used to play or uh, House of Pain, Jump Around used to play. That give you, you know, or uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit from Nirvana. Mm. That, that gives you a jump around feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's literature that talks about the feeling that music gives you, you know, mm -hmm. um, theoretically. Now, when you're playing music nowadays, that's homegrown. I mean, that, that's a significant factor here. A lot of the music that... I used to listen to was American music so I w you'd assimilate into their world but you couldn't properly because you never lived there mm -hmm. yeah you started learning the slang etc but if I was hearing music from Britain that I knew inside out from when I was living in Green, when I was living in Tottenham or whatever 
that would mean so much more more to me mm. let alone hearing about people I know in the area yeah. or these people that may have been sort of mythical characters gangster characters or whatever and they're rapping on the mic or people are mentioning their names they're mentioning streets and areas that I know and they're mentioning about stabbing this one or that one now a lot a lot of young people now are primed I mean you get someone that lives out in uh, a young white boy that lives out in Loughton mm -hmm. now that's got nothing to do with anything street orientated that where, once they start locking into that music they're wearing drop downs they got the, they got the belly on mm. you know out of the room the parents are smelling the skunk weed yeah mm. they don't know what's going on with their boy but that's how influential this music is so you could be so far removed or detached from that way of living that the music is so powerful that you become part of that anyway yeah and for young people that are immersed in that in certain areas it's too dangerous I mean I've got I used to have real problems thinking about drill music as a real genre of music because I'd say to a certain extent I was a hip-hop purist mm -hmm. especially with the the length of time I've listened to hip hop but it's like anything in life when you're young coming up you know there's trends in my day there was break dancing well first there was the robot then body popping and break dancing came along we wore certain clothes we had fat laces uh, you know um, then after that there was, <laughs> there was this Michael Jackson sort of leather leather scene that was going on you know uh, and people wore leather trousers and then people were wearing jumbo cords and split the bottoms of them and you know you go through trends as a youngster so and it's a form of expression of youth you know so mm. I understand that what I'm upset about is that it doesn't seem like anyone's saying anything different so these drill and grime artists or whatever the drill artists they've got skills a lot of them have got uh, talented but you know use your talents by promoting something different mm -hmm. you know that will fall in line with pushing a certain set of people forward rather than taking them backwards and you know myself and other people ending up at funerals of young people um, I've been to like three or four funerals now of uh, young people from 14 to 16 and every time I end up at a funeral it is painful to say the least you yeah. know definitely um, what are some of the negative impacts of capitalism on black communities, particularly in relation to crime and the exploitation of young black people? Capitalism is, is, is a double-edged sword to say the least, you know. It, it's funny, when I was at, at university at a late age, a place that I never thought I'd enter, um, I, that was a place I sort of learnt about capitalism and Karl Marx and studying um, Durkheim and Weber, but more so Marx. But understanding that socio-economic structure and how it functions and how it gives you the ability to replicate the legal structure on an illegal basis. Mm. So I can own the mode and means of production. I won't, but someone would illegally. And that'll get passed down. So someone will have the product, they'll pass it down to their workers. The workers get exploit, exploited mm. by going out there and doing the work. You know, in capitalism, you never get paid the money for the energy you put out. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about capitalism is there's movement. If you put in a certain level of work, you can move up. Even though, you know, in reality, you're not going to move to the higher echelons mm. because those people that are dupes and duchesses and you know etc etc they reside on that level but you can move up but capitalism itself has created a, a situation where you know young people are, especially those that come from poor communities they're ostracized uh, and vilified and, and demonized for being a certain way but capitalism has created a system for you to function illegally and make money so the drug game is capitalism right. you know? um, bottom line you, you get that with prostitution and everything it functions in the same way so capitalism itself even though it's a structure that 
can, if you're willing to put in the work, you know, your social status could, you could ascend in your social status. Um, but if you come from impoverished families and you're involved in gangs or, you know, you can actually start making money within a system that is illegal, but it's just a replication of a, the legal capitalist system. So, oh, yeah. you know. So how does um, issues like crime and poverty, how does it affect the development and opportunities of young black individuals? <sighs> you know, everything... When I came up, you know, uh, old school people didn't used to talk about the woes of life much. They just got on with it, mm. you know. I'm mindful nowadays, even as a father, and me trying to teach my children how to navigate this social space in the best way to become successful, that at certain points in time, I might say, don't you know about the cost of, <laughs> you know about the cost of living crisis? Mm. So, like I was saying, I mean, uh, crime and poverty is already projected into your, the poverty is already projected in your head sometimes by your parents. Mm. They're talking about this bill, that bill, I can't buy you this. Um, it's quite a strange situation because young people, because they're so savvy when it comes to making money and, and, and going through doors for opportunities to make money. Especially, it's quite a weird situation that even in school nowadays, kids are in school and they're hearing these these messages being communicated, maybe in the next room between mum and dad, or communicated to them about not being able to pay the BT bill, or mm. I can't get this. Some children feel forced to be able to make some money. You know, so, crime and poverty, I mean, they're interlinked. If you're poor, crime, you know, most of the gangs around the world, they come out of poverty. Mm -hmm. So as soon as poverty kicks in, it's sort of nearly a natural occurrence that crime. You have to be very strong not to go down that criminal road when, when poverty is kicking in. So for a lot of families uh, and black families as well, I mean, I talked about transgenerational trauma before. Um, surviving, um, so if you're generations previously lived in poverty um and now you're still in poverty if you came out of that you, you know your mum was poor your granny was poor you're poor more than likely your kids are going to be poor mm. you know and more than likely they'll end up being involved in some crime unless there's an uncle auntie a friend or someone or your just own genetic makeup enables you to bypass that and move on to something else. Mm. But, you know, nowadays, especially everything's all consuming, it feels like, for, for young people and for young black people to, to keep their head above water, especially in a society where things are talked about on a regular basis, discrimination, racism, poverty, gang crime, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of young black people out there that messages are being projected into their heads they're being digested and it's unsettling their ability to function normally mm. you know for for young black people there there there's actually a lot of attention on them every minute of the day yeah. you know whether it's on the news whether it's in media whether it's in music you know there there's a lot of um there's a lot of weight on their shoulders mm -hmm. what are some of the um, unique challenges faced by black mothers in raising their daughters in today's society? You know, it, it's funny because I hate making comparisons, but when you're a certain age, all you can do is make a comparison. You know, I think that nowadays, how women are presented on TV, um, how young people are presented on TV, mm -hmm. how film stars and... Uh, singers and musicians generally females i'm talking about mm -hmm. um and this comes from a very old school perspective uh, i i hate being a guy that wants to that talks in the old school way when we've moved forward historically mm -hmm. you know but um i know that in my day i mean i didn't have any any brothers or sisters so i'm just generalizing um 
my friends and uh, and their mums and and the women that I grew up with, you know, you had to dress a certain way. Mm -hmm. You couldn't show too much skin. Mm -hmm. um, styles were completely different. If someone had a mini skirt on, that was raunchy. Like, what? What's that? You know, what's going on there? Sort mm -hmm. of thing. <laughs> I mean, times have changed now. You know, and it's just fashion. But your daughter going out on the street late night with some friends to a party, um, dressed in meagre clothes to say the least, even though it's fashion nowadays. We know that things are quite tainted nowadays. You could go out like that with the best intentions to have a great time. Mm. But that guy over there, or those guys over there, they've got a different spin on things at night, you know. Mm. Um, so mothers out there in in their parenting have to be more aware, uh, you know. And I'm not saying they have to be. Uh, what I'm saying is that the ones that aren't, please be more aware. But there's a lot of mums out there doing a great job, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. But it, it, it's very challenging to say the least with uh, young men and young boys over sexualized and looking for something from your daughter. Um, there's young girls nowadays that, you know, that have become like boys. They actually talk the same language as boys. Yep. Yeah, fam, yeah, bruv, da da da. Um, uh, they're smoking weed. Uh, uh, a majority of the times in, in my occupation, when there's been major fights outside any schools, it's usually girl fights. Mm. Yeah? Um, a lot of the animosity between girls can never be squashed straight away mm. yeah with young boys you know you yeah. can talk with them you can get them together yeah. and it's calm young girls it's not so easy now with mums especially single mums that are just dealing with their daughter you'll see like in the teenage years as they go into teenage years it becomes this oppositional sort of fight between both of them uh, and sometimes when young girls you know like they say young girls mature quicker than boys but i think as well with the the influx of information to all young people young people nowadays think that they're adults yeah you know um i think social media has played a big role in giving young people a voice to communicate with adults in an adult way where before like in my day mm -hmm. you'd be kept in the room and the adults will take centre stage in the front room. Yes, right. Now you've got social media that allows young people to talk on a certain level with adults. And to a certain extent, they've been doing it for such a while now that they actually can do it in such a good way that some adults are on the back foot and it can become something else. Mm. So even the dynamic theory in the family home with the mum and daughter, you know, whether the dad's here, yes or no. But it's even more, it's even more difficult if mum's just there on her own with the daughter, mm. having to deal with this back and forth that can that can happen and then them get interested in boys and drugs and the things that used to be quite segregated. People knew that was sort of boy stuff, fighting, drugs, blah, blah. But it's not nowadays. Mm, it's it's right. everyone's, mm. you know. So it is very challenging for mums, especially with rate, you know, rates of pregnancy and young mums. You know, children bringing up children. Hmm. How can communities support black children from single parent households to ensure that they have access to the resources and guidance they need to succeed? <sighs> Aye, these questions are getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> um, you know, it's so mad that when we were talking earlier about capitalism and, and I think, you know, that's actually fragmented the communitarian sort of aspect of black culture and parenting together uh, and coming together as a community. Um, unless that can really happen, it's going to be hard work. Yeah, generally, black people have to come together. I mean, I, I said it earlier on about me going to the African Emancipation and Reparations March on Saturday in, in Brixton mm. um, and it was a beautiful day on August the 1st um, it was a Thursday um, and I went up there and everything was beautiful and then when it came to marching time there just didn't seem to be enough representation mm -hmm. for the march I mean 
there's not enough representation nowadays for much to do with black people um, and what's quite strange is that black people seemingly accept it quite a lot of black people apart from the ones that are proactive mm. in regards to trying to do grassroots work and work in the community um, and every other culture can see it mm. and they can identify that black people aren't together right. uh, and that's so worrying so unless communities north east south and west um, are willing to support each other like other communities do like the Turkish community does, mm. you know, like the Asian community does. Mm. Unless they're willing to pull it together like that, I have a few figures at the forefront of that. Um, it's going to be a long haul. But, you know, um, like I said before, capitalism, our, our own transgenerational trauma, there is a definite need to seek out riches and wealth before dealing with our own because we've suffered for so long mm -hmm. you know and people might say what do you mean but quite a lot of that processing is unconscious more than anything else that's right um how can black mothers empower their daughters to navigate um, societal changes and develop a strong sense of self-worth Oh, you know, when when you were saying that question, I was gonna answer it, I, and it'd be uh, it sounds like a contradiction. <laughs> it sounds like a contradiction for me to answer it as a black man. Okay, you know, if you know what I mean, like I could answer that from a black dad's perspective, mm. but I think a black woman would have a better say. A better say mm. on on how that goes, because I know that when it comes to time to talk about bringing up my boy, I can speak wholeheartedly. And you know, I've got two girls and, and one son. Um, and I've always relied on the mothers, even though I parent as a dad, as a father, I've always relied on the mothers to do the feminine aspects of things. You know? mm. What are some effective strategies mm. for addressing the root causes of violence and drug abuse in black communities? All right, so, They haven't found any yet. Okay. That's <laughs> for one, yeah. They haven't found any effective strategies yet. And the strategies that are out there sometimes that lay within certain organizations and a lot of grassroots organizations and some, you know, there's quite a lot of those in South London and a few down here. I don't know about West London and East London, but there must be black organizations. Um now those organizations sometimes operate individually mm -hmm. when they could become a conglomerate yeah and work with the community and develop these strategies now there are a, a number of organizations my, my friend um, runs one the kind Prince Foundation that does beautiful work um, in schools um, but there needs to be it's like it's like anything it's like it's like education you have a school and then you have an educational psychology, psychologist, and you've got a speaking language therapist, then you've got the Senko, then you've got these out, then you've got social care, then you've got all these uh, youth justice workers, then you've got, you've got this whole network mm. that supports that individual child or those children within the school. Yeah. Now, the strategies have to come from a place like that where we've got a network of black organisations that are able to do that work in a particular manner, um, not where there's these lit, these organisations that are littered all over the place that are doing good work in pockets of different areas, but it's not having a real impact holistically, you know, mm. across the nation. Yeah. So really, they have got strategies, and there's a lot of good work going on. Um, for me to say, all right, um, one strategy that'd be good. I mean, because you can think if you was going to think outside of the box it'd go beyond the community because you have to look at governmental powers mm. and what do you do? Do you allow knives to be sold in the pound shop? This is it. You know, do you uh, allow any sort of crazy equipment to be bought off Amazon? I've seen knives on Amazon that I think, well, how, how are you allowed to sell that? People can have access. There's certain things that come even before that, that, 
could be strategic mm. and practically in regards to moving certain, removing certain things. Yeah. You know, um, let alone the the sort of work that can be done by organisations um, as a collective with the community. So, in regards to strategies, I'd say that I'm not going to say that there's that I've got all the strategies, mm. but I know collectively there's a lot of organisations that have strategies and doing good work with young people to to encourage them uh, in regards to being successful in a certain area or developing their self-esteem and their self-identity. Um, you know, a lot of um, real social type of work um, with also sort of enterprise projects where people are allowing them to understand business and maybe get involved in music or selling something um, and di divert them off, you know, that street orientated path. But they have to come together. Again, it's about the collective coming together. Yeah. And also, you know, those powers that be investing more in them. Mm. You know, I, I've got a, I started off in my job as a mentor um, and later on become a, became a assistant head teacher purely based on the fact that someone believed in me, mm. you know, and that's what's needed. People at those, the higher echelons of wherever have to believe in and want this to end and believe in these organisations to push the money their way for them to do the great work. Mm. I, when I started off as a mentor, and this is what I was going to say, um, I, I saw so much um, and understood a lot on ground level, but as I moved up the ranks, I still understood because I still have an open ear. But when you move up, there's other things that you see that you don't know about down there. Mm. Now, for me being a mentor for a good couple of years, I understand that it's invaluable work. So instead of paying mentors pittance, pay them some good money to do that invaluable work. Because mm. teachers and other professionals can't do the work that mentors do but it's sort of downplayed right it's interesting I, I, that's 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 real talk obviously from my perspective yeah. coming from you know, the schooling system and that. how does the portrayal of black individuals in the media impact self-image and aspirations of young black people now i watched um a film called rye lane not too long ago, um, I, I, you know, and some people will be, it'll be controversial, so people will start maybe getting onto you on here when I talk about <laughs> Supercell, because I um, love that. I love talk, talk you to, yeah, because <laughs> I, I done an episode the other day where me and my boy was talking about it, so it'd be good to get your, um, your viewpoint. Yeah, so, you know, um, Supercell for me, for a young, was it Ratman? Is Rat it Ratman is the creator, yeah. 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 For him and is it Shiro's story? For the stuff that I saw on YouTube from him and for him to elevate to, to Netflix and that, you know, blow up in that way. Like, you know, I take my hat off to that guy. That that was amazing. Uh, and I think he's probably younger than me. So for uh, a, a younger guy to be able to set himself up and have that artistic talent to be able to ascend to, mm. to Netflix, that, that was a beautiful thing. But I thought that... That program was beautiful in the sense that a lot of black TV and movies, it's the same old nonsense. Mm. Yeah. You get the, you know, and I love Top Boy as entertainment. Now, but what does it depict? You mm. know, and I love it. Don't, don't <clears throat> get me wrong. I, as a 54-year-old man, can watch Top Boy and it not have an impact on my ability to to behave a certain way in society. For 13, 12, 13, 14 year old, it might not be. Blue Story is another one. Mm. Now with Supercell, even that had the gang element in it, it was more about heroes more than anything else. Right. When I watched Rye Lane, it was a beautiful black rom-com mm. um, that made you feel a certain way and laugh. Um, Supercell, all right, they had the little gang element, but you knew it was about superheroism mm. yeah and and special powers like avengers yeah so it gave you a different feel it didn't immerse you in a gang orientated way of living mm. so i know <laughs> i can watch top boy 
And when the Shane and um, what was Kano's character again? Sully. And Sully. When when they get and when Sully gives a certain look, I could yeah, I could feel a certain way myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. a 54 year old <clears throat> man. If I'm a, a 14 year old boy with my friends that roll around a certain way and smoke it up and behave a certain way, mm. when I see that, the impression it has on me is detrimental to me going forward. Because mm. then you know, there's a lot of imagery now. That is all, and that's why young girls are fighting. It's all about being hard. It's all about being at the top in mm. whatever way. So I've got the best clothes. I'm the hardest guy. I've got the best looks. I've got the nicest car. I've got the best skin. I've got whatever it is. Mm. You have to be top tier nowadays. Right. And that's how it is. So anything less than that becomes a problem. Now, when you've got too much wants that aren't really needs, mm. When you don't get them, that is painful, you know. So you put yourself in a re revolving door of pain. You want all these things um, that more than likely aren't attainable in the way that you want to attain them. Yeah. Or you can attain them, mm. but they'll go quickly mm -hmm. or something will happen to you. So they'll either go quickly and you're upset, you'll end up in jail and you're upset. But it's, an, it's a never-ending sort of revolving door of bad things are going to happen to you because of what's been promoted and projected into your head through through the media. I mean, how can you, when you're failing in school, when home life isn't good, um, how can you feel better about yourself than hanging out with some people and going on a certain way and people say to you, oh, you're that guy, mm. you're that guy. And then when you're, you're that guy, because you see when, the Shane or Sully's been talked to about in a certain way. You're that guy. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So you identify with that. So it just reinforces that. Yeah. That's right. I heard that. So add, adding on to that, what are the long-term effects of exposure to violence and trauma on the mental health and well-being of black children? Oh my God. Mental health of black children. I mean, mental health across the board nowadays is not good. Mm. Um, and and trauma uh, and trauma sort of compounded. So, it, let's say a lot of black people have got trauma going on inside of them anyway. Mm -hmm. Then on top of that, you've got other issues that are creating trauma in your family life. Then you've got outside of the home trauma of having to navigate your social space because right. you're scared that you're going to get stabbed on your road or whatever. Now, over time and nowadays, you know, people, young people have to find some sort of solace by partaking in more than likely drug misuse. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the only way you, you feel all right about what's going on daily. But at the same time, again, it's a double-edged sword because as much as it feel, makes you feel all right, it's actually having a really detrimental effect on your psyche. Mm. So next minute there's drug-induced psychosis, next minute you're being sectioned. Ultimately, that violence and the trauma, you know, you're gonna develop, yeah, you're gonna have to go to some, some therapist here and you're either gonna get sectioned, you're either gonna end up with something like borderline personality disorder, mm. uh, antisocial personality disorder or any type of disorder that you're not you, you're gonna be unable to function normal in society normally in society let alone around your family you know and it's not it's not unknown that when young black men especially are behaving in a certain way and it might not be the worst mm. that they can be easily sectioned you know there's data on that um, and that's upsetting. So just the whole, the whole um, violence and trauma thing can smash families to smithereens, to say the least. Mm -hmm. You know, because the long-term impact of mental health is, I've got a mentally ill child, and now I'm on this journey with you forever, mm -hmm. until I die, or until you pass away. The 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 support that is given to a young person, a young adult, young teenager, by mum or dad or both parties over time can wear you down, you know, and, I, and I've seen a few people myself that I know, I've had five friends sectioned over time um, 
and suffered mental illness. Mm. And, I, and I've seen some of the family members support them over a long period of time and seen how it's worn them down. Mm. You know, so it has a detrimental effect on most parties within that family anyway. So how can we promote positive representations of black families and relationships in the media to counter negative stereotypes and misconceptions? <sighs> maybe we need more black people in the media. Maybe, you know, maybe we need more black people speaking out about some stuff. Mm. Um, I think, you know, it's not easy in the world that we live in to speak up and not be seen like there's a chip on your shoulder. Mm. Um, that's, you know, there's this level of dissonance that's experienced when it comes to speaking up with black people sometimes. And really, a lot of the time it's because when you do speak up, a response to you speaking up isn't positive, mm -hmm. you know, um, and you're looked upon in a certain light. Yeah. So, for me, it, it, it's a very hard one, unless there's a, a lot of representation within the media. I mean, it's strange, because when, when you have to have an understanding of where you live. Mm. Um, I understand that I live in Britain, that's predominantly white. Um, we don't have to get catered for on a certain level. When I go to Trinidad, uh, and you know, the family that I stay with are Asian, on Trinidadian TV, the last time I was there, I mean, I was there when I was 11, 21, and 36. I never saw that many white programs on TV mm. because they're not, they're accommodating for the population that's there, that's right. you know. So it, it, it's sort of a double edged sword. Like, you, you could talk about media representation on a certain level, but if in England, we only make up like, so what's it, maybe 23% of the population or something like that, or yeah. whatever, you know. It, it, it's hard for people that aren't immersed in our culture to think outside, to the, outside of the box and say, all right, we need to give these people that, mm. you know. And those are the sort of people we actually need, unless we're going to have more black representation in the media that are able to... Um, promote things in a certain way with a certain narrative that is positive mm. that is more uplifting for black people yeah. I mean I'm tired of watching all kinds of nonsense that makes me that puts my mind in this wannabe gangster zone or or another funeral sort of situation mm -hmm. when I watched Rye Lane and Supercell that gave me a feeling that was nothing like that mm. I didn't even think of anything like that you know and uh, I think if if um, media, they're missing the trick with putting out more product, and that, that's what we could talk about anyway. If they put out more, uh, you know, solving the problem of street violence, if you tapped into people's minds through media with more positive messages and more positive programs and film, that would be also a strategy that will support people moving forward and this, this sort of um, violence ending. Mm. I, I, I totally agree, but you know, I don't think, I, I think anything that's successful um, coming from the black community, do, um, like through the media wise, it, it doesn't really last long out there. Like for a prime example, you've got something successful and really good as the, the real McCoy that came out back in the day. I, w I remember when it finished, I couldn't understand why it wasn't continued. You've got all of these other, talk, um, all, of the, all these other shows, like let's pick a random one, like Friends. Mm. And then they'll have like, eight seasons or you know what I mean they'll have some crazy amount of seasons and it's just stretching out but when it's us we just get a one pop and it's done I and mean, we just have to settle with that I've always found that like confusing and at the same time I could see like oh there's a game at play here yeah you know what I mean and the thing is you know it's again it's a double edged sword of reality and conspiracy theory mm. and people will say that it borders on conspiracy theory um, as, uh, that sort of falls in line with the chip on your shoulder mm. because when you talk about certain things there's always this oppositional sort of dissonance 
because people are getting their back up and they get really defensive mm. about you know what you're saying yeah but i think generally um i forgot what i was saying there. <laughs> oh, you, you're building on the, um, the aspect of um of where it's coming from in the sense of like um, you was mentioning about reality and conspiracy theory yeah and, so and direction. yeah sorry so that's the thing when things are going down people will think all right what you're saying there's not enough black programs there's not enough this this is happening that's happening ah you've got problems but then there's the reality that there's this data that shows there's these actual problems mm. so if people started um accepting the data um and moving in accordance with it to to solve issues that are going on socially then you know we'd we'd be moving in the right direction mm. Uh, it, it actually feels in society that as much as you take 10 steps forward, you take 20 backwards. Mm. Mm. And there were programs back in my day. I mean, they had um, No Problem. They had, um, what's that, Barbara? The Desmonds. Desmonds you know, right. they had a lot of different shows on them. But yeah. now I think with, with media changing and they're having Prime, Netflix, Disney, blah, blah, blah. Um, homegrown British-born programs aren't as prevalent as before especially long-standing ones yeah no there isn't i felt that when i when i was watching top boy like i obviously i watched it late so i got uh, the opportunity to blitz it how i wanted to yeah and i blitz through it very quickly and as soon as i'm finished now i'm i'm trying to think all right it's like i've got the hunger for black english tv as such and it just wasn't nothing to follow it yeah i think there was one or two but when i started them, i said ah this is this is terrible so i just turned it off so i mean where's the black because remember, there's there's a situation here where you get um, a show that's produced in seasons. Mm. Yeah, where's the coronation black coronation street? Where's the you know where's the black Emmerdale? Where's mm. the program that comes on every week religiously, continuously, and you never know when it's going to end? It might never end because mm. Emmerdale Farm's been going on since I was a youth. Yeah, 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 you yeah know? that's right. And, and, and Coronation Street, Street as well. well yeah. yeah. So where's that black program that's on a continuum? If, uh, me as a person that is um, artistic, and not just musically. I'm a person that likes to write scripts and that. Now I'm not. I'm not. My strength doesn't really. I wouldn't say is immersed in that. Like to to a massive point. Like there's like some other individuals, but I think there is individuals out there that are putting those things together of those sort of shows but mm. just not getting the platform yeah. because I know that I'm writing certain stuff yeah. and I can't be the only one do you know what I mean so yeah I just think there's a misrepresentation I think there's most probably people that self-doubt as well maybe ah, oh, maybe I'm not good enough maybe this isn't good enough and right now the, the, the thing is like did you ever get to watch um uh, what was it called money and violence was no. it money and violence was it yeah money and violence Money and Violence was a, um, uh, a show that um, it was a New York natives put it out. And it's, it's like a Top Boy type of scenario, but it's New York, Brooklyn and all of that sort of stuff. I loved it. it was, they, they filmed it off their own budget, with own cameras, everything. They didn't even really have a budget. It was just a group of people from the hood. They made characters, made stories, and then they started to... It, it blew up to the point where Jay-Z, I think, got involved. It went on... It went on. Is it Tidal? Was his thing called Tidal? Yeah. He started to put it... He started to get involved in it. It got to a point where it was getting really big. The only reason why it um, stopped is because the, uh, the guy who... I, I think was um, the main head and he was one of the main actors and his, his close friend at the time was one of the main actors they fell out so then from once them two fall out and those are two of the main actors you can't really continue the show because how it was left the story needed to be told you can't just start it again and he's yeah. not there so like what I'm trying to get at is there, there is there is people out there doing stuff and the lane that they could take is when you initially first putting stuff out, you got platforms like YouTube where millions of people's watching this thing. Yeah, so that's why it blew up like that. So I just think, from my perspective, people just need to have a bit more self belief and grind in the dirt a bit, push the thing out through these mediums like YouTube, Rumble, and all of that. And then once we get behind it, then yeah. you can demand it going elsewhere and getting more of a budget. That's uh, just my take yeah. I think yeah. the lack of self esteem. I mean, I, I, I talked before about colonial life mm. yeah and and it passing down i mean it's quite weird how you know and it's funny that those people out there that want to 
object to the truth being spoken. Mm. Um, don't actually acknowledge how trauma is played out. The, the, the way we had to behave on, uh, in colonial living gets played out in modern day times. I mean, the book Brainwashed by Tom Burrell puts it down eloquently and you know when you see the parallels between the adaptation on the plantation mm. and us existing today and black families I mean there was things that I, I looked at and read that when I read them I thought all oh, right is that really happening so you know the the on the on the on the plantation the slave master was was the husband mm. ultimately yeah the black man had no power mm. so your wife could get raped whenever um your daughter could get raped whenever your daughter could get raped as your uh, if i'm the slave master my son might be put forward for that initiation into manhood that means sleeping with someone mm. that means sla sleeping with uh, a slave's daughter she might be 11 12 13 whatever now as a black man you've at that time you had no power at all um and how emasculating is that so that's the situation in the home you're getting beaten your wife's getting raped blah 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 now in modern day, in modern Britain, across the world, you know, it's not uncommon for people to say that black women <laughs> say sometimes, what are you doing for me? What can you do for me? What you, you know? Obviously, there was not much that a black man could do for a woman then. Mm. So if that was verbalised then, in whatever capacity, that same statement or response is expressed nowadays mm. um this preoccupation with women being hoes in the music if your wife's getting raped on a regular basis um and not coming back home um disheveled the 10th 12th 20th time that has happened you might start feeling a certain way about your wife enjoying that mm. um what's been played out nowadays is this real derogatory sort of music about how women are bitches and hoes all the time the the slave the little slave child on the on the plantation can't roam around freely because if they roam around freely they might get eaten up by the slave master and get beaten or something might happen to them so the mum has to keep the child close just like in shops like in my day more so I always see black families, the children are right there. Mm. I'm not letting you run and run around like little Freddy over there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But that's a practice that we learned from back on the plantation. So there are these parallels that if you look closely under the microscope, that we're still existing in a sort of colonial way. How we adapted on, on the plantations, we still exist like that. Yeah. You know, and how we see um <clears throat> the the discrepancies and, and the conflict between light skin and dark skin, um, house negro and field negro, um, the young and the old, and and females and males. Mm. The conflict still that existed on the plantation from the manipulation of us still exists today, you know, mm. and there's loads of other examples that that are documented, you know, but we, we still have to deal with that trauma and still try and unpick if you're intelligent in not even intelligent enough if you're aware enough mm. to understand what's going on with you yeah. and maybe do a little reading or have some conversations with some of your people that are quite meaningful you can start understanding better why you might behave in certain situations in a certain way mm. you know or collectively with, with friends in a certain way or within your family in a certain way you know so mm. Yeah, I hear that, man. Um, that's a fact because like, a lot of the time, if you see like what's was a lot that was prevalent in um, like uh, social media and stuff right now, it is the battle like between man and woman, mm. especially the black man and the black woman. They're always trying to go like, you know, the black woman's too demanding. She's too this, and she's a boss bitch, and she don't need no man. She's independent, and when you say she's independent, she's independent of who. Because it has to be the man; it can't be anybody mm. else. So you can see all of these divisions being played out, and you know it's a in, it's interesting when you you notice that that that's coming from a certain era, 
you know what I'm saying um, and we're still car carrying on to this tradition if you want to mm. call it that um, all right so last question mm. what steps can be taken at the societal level to address the complex interplay of factors affecting black children including uh, absent fathers, education, media influence, and community violence. Sorry, can you read that again, please? I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> what steps can be taken at societal level to address the complex interplay of factors affecting black children, which include absent, absent fathers, education disparities, media influence, and community violence? You know, if 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 I had a ma magic wand, there'd be an organisation that could do that. I mean, at, at, at baseline level, it has to be the community getting together. Mm. You know, before that, really, you've got to understand this. If I want to become a success, unless I'm lucky. And I've got a rich uncle or people that can get me in through the door. Mm. I've got to do that myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, For the work, for the outcomes that we want to achieve, no one wants them as much as us. So we have to do that work ourselves. So unless it's the community starting to get together. Can I ask you a question? Just sorry to interject on that one. But in my mind, as soon as we're talking about this, my mind's gone straight to uh, Marcus Garvey, right? So Marcus Garvey had no internet, no social media, no, all he had was his newspaper where he started. But he had over a million people strong, ready to, to be involved and ready to do what, what else needs to be done to, to, to help the vision. What is going on with us where we have all of the, the, the means, we have, we, have, we have the phones, we have the, the, the apps and we have everything, but the togetherness and the, 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 the unity is not there at all. You know what, you know what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny that you say that um, uh, and and forgive my laughing because my laughing sometimes is out of disbelief mm. that there are and, and capitalism plays quite a deep role in people feeling comfortable in people feeling I've had conversations with people um, and people that know me know that in my personal life I do talk about first you know people have to know I'm a, I'm, I'm a humanist being a human comes before being black only because if the world was, if we lived in a utopia, we wouldn't even be called black. Mm. We'd just be humans. Right. But because people saw it as something, they had to label us. Mm. And with those labels came a lot of negativity. But mm. I'm a human first before anything else. That's right. You know, but, um, you know, like I was saying, and, and it's quite, sorry, my old age, my brain goes sometimes, but... What it is, capitalism has become a buffer for the fire inside. Mm. So, the more you could earn, the more wealth you could attain, um, the more you could look good, started making other preoccupations with the wider community play the back burner. Mm. So... Even even now, I've had conversation with people, and I might be talking about the ISIS papers. Mm. I might be talking about a Carla's book. I might be talking about Robin Walker. I might be talking about oh, Milana Karenga. Any book I'm reading around Black history and anything, but if it comes into a situation where I start talking about Mary Tucker being hung, and before a a pregnant lady that got hung in the 1800s in in America, and then she was pregnant and they cut her baby out and stamped on the baby, stamped the baby to death. Now, that's part of our history. Uh, I read as much as I can in regards to black history and educate my children about it. Uh, uh, maybe not so much the heinous aspects yet. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of black people that don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear that, yeah? They just want to get on with how they're living. Mm. So part of the lack of unity is that capitalism has taken away the fire because people will rather stay in their house, drive their nice car, 
eat a nice food, take a picture of their food in a restaurant, <laughs> mm. put it on social media, then actually support um, in, you know, and it only takes little things. It doesn't have to be a uh, major support where you've got to give loads of money or do loads of things every day. It's, uh, you know, you can do little things like, you know, have a conversation with your friends and then maybe post something on social media that's positive. Or do, you could do all kinds of little things mm. to start getting the ball rolling. But people, a lot of black people now are scared of hearing the real in regards to the oppression and discrimination and racism. They don't want to hear about the, I mean, it's weird because there's even a lot of black people that don't know their history, mm. you know, uh, and you don't have to have an in-depth knowledge about Monomatap or the Swahili Confederation or Nubia or Tarseti, whatever your Kusha, whatever you want to call their um, Nok Empire, Yoruba, etc. You know, Axiom or whatever. You don't have to have an in-depth knowledge of ancient history. But at least have a skeleton outline mm. of where we came from and have an understanding that, you know, for how many thousands of years we controlled a continent in a certain way and had such an impact globally on the world mm. that we're still seeing in a certain light even through negativity mm -hmm. you know so it, it, it's, it, it's not easy when a lot of black people out there uh, and that's a generalization and I'm only making that generalization because you're not seeing things happen right you know but there's a lot of black people out there that are sort of standoffish from getting involved in black issues, um, hearing information that, that's unsettling. Um, yeah, so for me, it's it, unless people jump on the bandwagon and that fire's ignited, um, more so, you know, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale and the Black Panther movement and the Black Panther movement over here, mm -hmm. and people that were advocates for pro-blackness, but positivity, like... Let's bring that back. People, what I'm sick of are people grumbling and not doing anything. That's why I'm the sort of person, if I've got the ability to go and do something when I'm not working or looking after my children, I'll go. You know, I'll go on the march. I'll go and do this. I'll go and do that. You know, and I'll play my role. I work with um, disaffected young people. Mm the main demographic I work with are black and black boys. So I'm still putting in the work and putting out the messages and trying to infuse and instill in these young boys something more than just street orientated way of living. You mm. know? So black people have got to get it together a bit more. And, and you know, I'm mindful I've, I've met some young people that are really positive. Um, and I'm hoping just like there's a generation of young people that at the negative end of the spectrum, I know that there's that at the positive end of the spectrum. Mm. So hopefully, I mean, when I went on the, there was two or three marches I went on during the Black Lives Matter stages after George Floyd's death. And what I saw from young black people, um, you know, I, I, I was astounded by just the representation across the board by all people. It was beautiful. Mm. But the young black people that had this sort of black panther spirit in them, talking about equality, uh, you know, and equal rights. I was blown away. So, you know, it's out there. Yeah, yeah. Over the oceans like slave boats shipping me Hashtag that's the only way that they listen be The vocalist that verifies it vividly I bring the vortex straight to your vicinity What is outside is within The mind regulates the hand that masters the pen The pen is mightier than the sword But the tongue is mightier still The star gate to the mind's revealed Yeah, and yo what's outside is within The mind regulates the hand that masters the pen The pen is mightier than the sword But the tongue is mightier still The star gate to the mind's revealed The vortex